You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. A Federal Judicial Center program. Bankruptcy Law Update. And now, here is our moderator, Vice Dean Lawrence Poneroff of Tulane University Law School. Hello and welcome to the second in our series of Bankruptcy Law Update programs produced by the Federal Judicial Center here in Washington, D.C. This month, as always, our goal is to look at some of the latest and we think most important developments in bankruptcy law. To do that, we have gathered together a distinguished panel of judges, academics, and practitioners to provide their insights and analysis on this constantly changing area of practice. Joining us for today's programs, our names and faces I think will be familiar to all of you. We have Professor Margaret Howard from the Vanderbilt University Law School, David Lander, head of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Department at Thompson Coburn in St. Louis, Judge Robert Martin, Chief Bankruptcy Judge from the Western District of Wisconsin, and Judge Thomas Small of the Eastern District of North Carolina. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to begin our discussion with Professor Howard, who has written for us perhaps the most provocatively titled paper we've had on this program, Stripping Down and Stripping Off. I believe the reference is intended to be to secured claims in bankruptcy and specifically Section 1322b2. But perhaps, Professor Howard, you could explain the distinction between those two concepts and, and why they become important. Well, my own reaction is that strip off is a new term that has been coined so that we're not stripping down because we know we're not supposed to strip, strip down. So when we say strip off, we're not doing what, the, what we're prohibited from doing. Um, the problems I actually began with Dusnum, which said to us we cannot strip down an undersecured lien in a Chapter 7 context. But there's, there are variations of fact patterns that have since come up that present um, new questions. And the fact pattern that has, has produced the strip off as opposed to the strip down is the fact pattern in which a creditor has a junior lien. And that lien is so junior, it may be second, it may be third, fourth, whatever, but it's so far down in priority that there is no value in the property for that particular creditor, were that property liquidated what we would call basically an unsecured claim. We would, we would call it an unsecured claim under our 506A instincts. Uh, post bifurcation it would be an unsecured claim. This is a creditor that is underwater. Um, I rather like the, the expression underwater, it says a lot to me. Um, so the question becomes after Dusnup and after Nobleman, especially after Nobleman, whether the debtor can file a Chapter 13 and seek to eliminate the lien of that underwater creditor, convert them into an entirely unsecured creditor and treat them that way in the plan. And is there anything in Nobleman and is there anything in 1322b2 that says we can't do that, says a debtor is prohibited from doing that. Uh, the, the authorities had been fairly split. Um, I suppose they're still fairly split. Or one, one case says that the uh, minority is a burgeoning minority, so I don't know if the division, I, I don't count cases in that sense. We do now have three circuit level cases that have come out this year, since March. We have the McDonald case from the Third Circuit, the Barty case from the Fifth Circuit, and the Tanner decision out of the Eleventh. All three of them taking the position that Nobleman and 1322b2 are no bar to the debtor that wants to convert such an underwater claim to an unsecured claim and treat them that way in the plan. How do these decisions deal with, as I understand the minority position in the lower courts uh, that takes the expansive view of, of noblemen, uh, hinges the argument critically on uh, Justice Thomas's rights analysis in noblemen that you can't modify the rights of a secured mm -hmm. creditor which exist independent of value or um, equity. How, how have those courts gotten around um, that part of the nobleman decision? I think it's fair to say that the courts believe that there is some tension in the nobleman decision. Um, yes, Justice Thomas did say that, 
but there's also other language in the nobleman decision that focuses on 506A, the bifurcation section. And uh, the nobleman decision says that the debtors were correct in looking to 506A for a judicial valuation of the collateral and noting that uh, because there was value in the collateral for the creditor in the nobleman fact pattern, in other words, undersecured, not underwater, because there was value, the creditor in that case had a secured claim, a post-bifurcation secured claim. So when you take that language suggesting that you look to 506A, it does have a role to play. And then you add that to the rights discussion. Uh, these courts say well, there's a tension in, uh, between those two views and how do you uh, cope with that tension? Well, the way that these courts are coping with it uh, is suggesting that uh, the best way to read those together, and I think Mac uh, the McDonald case um, has, has a good explanation of how to read those together. The best way to read those together is to suggest the debtor starts with 506A. And if under 506A there is no value in the collateral, so there will not be a post-bifurcation secured claim of any amount, then we don't have a problem with having a secured claim that has protected rights. Let me ask you a different kind of question. Um, there's some, some policy considerations mm -hmm. going on in these decisions as, as well, which I, I think is a product of the, the type of loans we're usually dealing with when we're mm -hmm. dealing with these um, wholly underwater liens. Are, are, are these um, primarily 100% uh, plus home equity loans? Uh, are they primarily consumer spending debt and, and not really home acquisition debt? Is, how, how is that played well, out? Well, I, I did a, a, a quick read of as many cases as I could, uh, could find at, at the time. I won't say that I read every case. I would say I passed the mark of due diligence. <laughs> so, uh, what I found were homeowners association assessments in, a, in a two or three okay. of the cases, mechanics liens, there's actually a mechanics lien uh, case out there, home improvement loans, uh, and the debt consolidation or home equity loans. Um, one of the policy concerns is this notion that, and we get that out of the, uh, the Stevens concurring opinion in Nobleman, uh, the notion that 1322b2 was designed to protect the mortgage loan market. So we want to have mortgage lending available for debtors to be able to buy homes. The way we do that is protecting those interests in bankruptcy. Well, these are simply not the kinds of liens that are involved in the completely underwater situation. I did not find one case in which we had a purchase money mortgage that was completely underwater and was threatened with strip off in any one of these cases without regard to which way the court decided it. You know, we, we uh, ruled pretty quickly after Nobleman that if you had an underwater situation, you could strip off. And so we've had a lot of experience with this, mm -hmm. and uh, these are not contested matters. The, the motions are filed, and usually clearly they're underwater, and the, the liens are uh, stripped off. The question that comes to my mind is if you can do this in Chapter 13, and you can't do this in Chapter 7, uh, many of the Chapter 13 plans uh, get dismissed because they, they don't make their payments, or they have the absolute right to dismiss. What happens on a dismissal with respect to that lien that has been stripped off? It's, uh, I, I think... Well, that's, that's a tension that mm -hmm. runs throughout Chapter 13 on what happens pre-discharge. Uh, because discharge comes at the end of the case, unlike in Chapter 11 where it becomes, comes at the confirmation of the plan, there are various other issues where we've had the same problem. And I think that probably you have to look to 349 and say, on dismissal, certainly, then it's reinstated. Well, it's on, reinstated, on, but as a practical matter, the well, property it, may have been sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if they had no interest in it, no, no secured claim in it, no uh, value, then the fact that it gets sold during the, the short time after that's determined, I'm not too concerned that any injustice has been done. Well, if you, if, uh, you talk about conversion rather than dismissal, that's and harder. you're not dealing with 349, uh, and then you could uh, convert to Chapter 7 and you could have stripped off in, and, and uh, that would still be valid while you could not have done it had you filed initially under Chapter 7. What you're suggesting is that there is a way around Dusna. Well, possibly. <laughs>
which grieves me none, <laughs> as I'm sure comes as no surprise. Uh, there are other ways around dues. Now, I think the filing of a uh, 7 followed by the quick 13, this so-called Chapter 20, the Johnson versus Home State Bank, is a way potentially around dues. Now, especially given that on remand it was found not to be uh, uh, filing like in good faith. So this may be another backdoor way around dues now, and you may have identified it. And of course, if that lien never had any value mm -hmm. to begin with, then I don't think we've done the, the so-called secured lender any injustice by leaving them with a purely unsecured well, claim in seven, because that's what it is. They're definitely not, they're de definitionally not a secured lender under 506 if there's no value in the collateral. So I guess I'm not distressed at all. I think that's an easy threshold to apply and a nice place for the cutoff. The nice thing is, of course, if real estate values are escalating during all this time, it gives you a situation that really makes your head spin. Well, there's the possibility you'll come into the money yeah. Yeah, because right, of the escalation right. of value. And, of course, that appreciation was on the mind of the Supreme Court in the Dues Nothing. Yeah. Well, what about valuation? Because that's what we're really talking about is being one dollar makes the difference well, number, between right. whether yes. the lien's preserved or avoided. A number of these courts uh, that are going with the burgeoning minority suggest that valuation is one reason why they do so, because that puts such a heavy load on the valuation determination because of this one dollar potential. And they can also take this another step and suggest that it invites strategic behavior by debtors who, recognizing that uh, almost undersecured lien number one is right there at the line, they stop paying secured uh, senior lien and allow senior lien to build up in terms of debt pushing it out of the money so it's now only partially secured and very slightly undersecured. That pushes the junior completely underwater. Presto, you now have the completely avoidable. But isn't that slightly a law professor's argument that in fact very yes. few, very <laughs> few, very few debtors have any clear notion of the value of their property, much less the balance due on their various loans. Well, Jen, and to, to have somebody who knew enough about both of them to be that precise strains my and, credulity. And let me suggest another strategy. <laughs> what about the junior lien holder, who of course has this sort of sophisticated hole on the fat right. pattern you, you're, you were thinking of, can that creditor pay a little something to the senior lien to pay down the senior lien to make them fully secured and obtain that dollar, hundred dollars of secured claim that puts them under the protection well, of the Well, what this demonstrates is how the one dollar making such a huge difference creates this, uh, this, this artificial uh, playing field yeah. because the stakes could be very high on the basis of one dollar under or one dollar over. But Nobleman forces that yes. because yes. there's no way yes. around the fact that right. partially secured debt right. cannot be modified in, in 13. And let's not overlook that, that it, it seems to me anyway one of the things that the cases seem to behave as if we can accomplish by prohibiting strip-off is suggesting we're putting money in the pocket of the creditor. And you cannot create e economic value simply by such a court holding. You can't do that. At some point, the debtor is going to look at the fact pattern and it's going to say, look, I am being asked to pay so many hundreds of thousands, maybe, or thousands of dollars, more than this house is worth. I'm just going to have to give it up as much as I would rather keep it. You give it up, all bets are off under Nobleman. You simply uh, send it out for liquidation, or you're in a seven to start with, perhaps. There, there's no protection for that creditor then. And then it's the economic fact of no value that comes home to them. So I don't think creditors uh, actually should have much of an interest in pressing this too hard. Especially not at the cost that it takes to put on a valuation hearing. And presumably the burden on them, if there's any objection to their claim, would would mean that they would have to uh, essentially put, come forward with evidence, which is a hard thing to do in valuation. What you're balancing here is an economic and a non-economic cost too. Mm -hmm. From the debtor's point of view, you know they always say you can take a security interest in my bed. It isn't much good to the party that has a security right. interest, but it's real valuable to the person that's sleeping in it. And uh, <laughs> you sort of have the same notion here. So you're you're balancing an economic concern, maybe the macro concern with the creditor who is looking at these cases on a national basis. Yeah. And, I'm sorry. I was going to say it's the idiosyncratic value to the debtor that leads the debtor to be willing to be the, perhaps the only person in the world mm -hmm. who will pay more than an arm's length market value for that house. So these sorts of holdings, if you can't have 
uh, strip off really give the creditor a substantial amount of leverage over that debtor. If the creditor knows the economic facts, knows that there's actually zero value in the property, were the debtor pushed to a liquidation, they don't want to push the debtor that far, but the debtor's willing to pay a little more than somebody else might pay. And that allows the creditor to extract this economic value. And it seems to me that setting up a bankruptcy system that enables that kind of behavior is just wrong thinking. Okay. And of course, in an economic sense, the parties that are really hurt are the unsecured creditors oh, who are, are getting less as a result of the plan payments than those plan payments having to go pay that secured debt. And the Chapter 13 is so often a, a, a zero-sum game. Well, you're not suggesting, are you, that, that even Nobleman requires that you pay the full secured debt in the Chapter 13 plan. It just means that the discharge will not rid the debtor of the lien. But what about the monthly installment payments? Don't those have to continue at the same level? They may, yeah. Which may but be impractical. If, if it extends beyond the length of the plan, the mm -hmm. effect is only that they will still there will still be an obligation at the end of the plan, not right. that that you're, you have to pay the entire amount during the plan. Oh, you can default at any time. And, and because the secured claim survives bankruptcy, Long v. Bullard, mm -hmm. um, and the, the uh, debtor can give up the house at a later time, of course. Sure. And then your point is a very good one, that if there is a foreclosure, and that is a, a second that really has little value behind a large first, right. the, the market's going to wipe out the second right. in a way that what we're saying is that bankruptcy can't do in these circumstances. Right. So the bank wins the battle and loses the war. Um, unless it's very careful in, in how yeah. it uh, how it proceeds, and I, you know I think the Fifth Circuit um, in uh, in its decision um, made some some reference to this in, in the sense that um, uh, the court talked about 1322C2 mm -hmm. and the fact that if the um, term of the mortgage is is going to run to maturity during the life of the plan, then you can modify, mm -hmm. right. indicating congressional intent. That in in point of fact, this is really just consumer spending debt. It's it's not mortgage debt, and uh, that we should permit modification because it doesn't fit the narrow justification for 1322C2. Um, it's not a statutory argument, but but I think there's a, a, a great deal of um, sense or logic to that mm -hmm. kind of reasoning. There is a great deal of logic to that reasoning. I think it gives the Congress perhaps more credit than might be do in this situation, because I'm not so sure that ever crossed the minds of the legislators. But nonetheless, I think the structure of the code does suggest that very, that very position. Well, I think we have this problem um, solved. <laughs> um, we're as in far agreement. as we're going to be able to solve it. We're in agreement on, on this one. Let's just hope the rest of the circuits follow suit so we don't get a split uh, and see it go up and get dues nub too. Um, we want to turn next to another um, uh, consumer bankruptcy law uh, topic. Um, Judge Martin, I'm going to turn to you for this. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that the uh, fraud exception to dischargeability in 523A2 is uh, the most important and frequently um, litigated of the exceptions. For a long while, there was some uncertainty under subparagraph A of what the elements of a non-dischargeable claim were. Uh, the Supreme Court spoke to the issue in Fields versus Mann several years ago, told us you just incorporate the elements of, of common law um, fraud, and, and we thought now that uh, this issue was clarified. Um, but um, the uh, chief judge of the circuit in uh, your circuit, in the Seventh Circuit, has recently rendered a decision that um, perhaps casts that in doubt and, and may have some broader um, implications, meaning it's, it's worth discussing that exception again. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one because just when I uh, had started to understand the difference between reasonable reliance and the less familiar but now correct justifiable reliance, Judge Posner has explained that we can have actual fraud with no reliance whatsoever. And uh, he's probably right, at least in the case he decided. Actual fraud in the Seventh Circuit at least may occur in a form other than misrepresentation. And this is quite a movement from what we've known as common law fraud. I think most of us thought, think of common law fraud in terms of five fingers of fraud. You know, various courts have had various numbers of fingers, apparently. But basically, there are, there are the elements that uh, go into the fraud, which uh, Judge Posner limits to fraud by misrepresentation. The case of McClellan versus uh, Cantrell, 
And the only site I have it on it is 2000 Westlaw 876933, 2000 WL 876933. Um, the facts are the sort that generate novel remedies. Um, I'll have to refer to my notes to get them in detail. McClellan sold the debtor's brother $200,000 worth of ice making machines on a time basis. Uh, McClellan took a security interest in the machines but didn't perfect it. The brother made no payments and McClellan started a state court action to recover the machines and to enjoin any transfer of the machines. While the case was pending, the brother sold the machines to his sister, who is the ultimate debtor, for $10. She knew about the suit and was in collusion with her brother. Uh, Cantrell then sold the machines for $160,000, and no one knows uh, where that money went. McClellan added the sister, Cantrell, as a defendant in the state court action for fraudulent conveyance, Two years later, while the state court case was still pending, Cantrell filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy, and McClellan filed an adversary proceeding to recover the debt she owed him as a recipient of a fraudulent transfer and to have that debt declared non-dischargeable under 523A2A. The bankruptcy court dismissed the adversary proceeding, and the district court affirmed because in Fields v. Mann, uh, the Supreme Court recently scoffed at the idea that a debt could be non-dischargeable under the fraud exception of 523A2A without a showing of material misrepresentation and reliance on the statement. So in essence, what Judge Posner did is that he opined that Field v. Mann spoke only to fraud by misrepresentation and that there are other forms of actual fraud contemplated by 523A2A. Now it's interesting because he found no other appellate cases to support his conclusion. He did cite um, the general language from a 1952 case out of Oklahoma to the effect that fraud is a generic term which embraces all the means that human ingenuity can devise for one individual to gain advantage over another. Um, that quote and a reference to a statement in Collier's treatise apparently satisfied Judge Posner's mind that uh, the Supreme Court's direction to look toward the common law uh, in describing fraud. So he felt that it was sufficient description of the common law to which Field versus Manns directed the court was to have one case out of Oklahoma and a site and uh, quote in Collier's. Um, the quote in Collier's is, 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 I'll read exactly what uh, Judge Posner said about it because I think it's important. It says, Collier's treatise, while assuming along with the cases we have cited that actual fraud involves misrepresentation, defines the term more broadly as any deceit, artifice, trick, or design involving direct and active operation of the mind used to circumvent and cheat another. Well, that's really broad language. And, and one of the things, I'll, I'll just as an aside, I think those of us who've been in the bankruptcy world for a while are f perfectly aware of the Collier cycle, where there's an undocumented statement in Collier's, which is then cited in a case and appears as a footnote in the next edition of Collier's. So I'm sure that we will now find that the Collier's statement is, is well supported. Um, in, in getting to this point, uh, Judge Posner reasons that actual fraud in the statute is contrasted to constructive fraud only, and that was the purpose of adding um, actual fraud in the uh, 1978 code. Um, prior to that, in Section 17 of the Act, there was no reference to actual fraud. It was um, and he, he said that the addition of actual fraud to the statements about misrepresentation were to say that there was something more than misrepresentation. So, um, the way I read this is if Cantrell had purchased the ice machine for $10 but had no intention to deprive McClellan of its val the, the, the machine's value, her fraud, if any, would have been at most constructive. 
But because she colluded with her brother, it was an active fraud because she possessed the intention to deprive, to cheat uh, McClellan. And because it was actual fraud, it fell within this definition. I, I don't know where to start with this one. So let me just, because uh, to mix my metaphors, I, I see this case as unleashing a can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me just throw out a, a, a couple of things for, for, the, for the group. Um, no requirement of a misrepresentation, uh, which may have interesting implications in the credit card oh, yes. and NSF check cases. No requirement of reliance, and as I understand it, the debtor in the case where the debt is declared non-dischargeable was not the individual who originally incurred the debt. It's uh, the sibling. Of yeah, the that original. point doesn't bother Judge Posner for long because he said that the debt that ran from the bankruptcy debtor Cantrell to McClellan arose when she became the recipient of a fraudulent transfer, which was not a constructive fraud but an actual fraud. So it the, the debt that she owed did originate with a fraud. So if the original debtor files, the debt is not dis is dischargeable because it's just an ordinary, ordinary contractual claim. But if the transferee files, the debt is non dischargeable. Well, Judge Posner hints that the even the brother would have had a non-dischargeable debt had he filed because when he made the transfer, it was a transfer in actual fraud and created a new debt. new debt. And that debt would have been only the size of the value of the collateral transfer, the property transferred, not the total debt that was originated on the sale is of it, the machines in the first place. Isn't that 523A6 and not 523A2? Are we under the wrong mm. provision? Entirely? Well, that's what the, the concurring opinion by Judge Ripple suggests. Um, I find that opinion equally unsatisfactory because in dealing with that, he assumes an injury to property, which at least historically, again, if you go back to the common law antecedents of that, it was in conversion. And in conversion, there had to be some demand made. And so there probably wasn't a demand made, so there are probably elements of conversion that are lacking which would have gotten it under A6. But but because that's only a concurring opinion, you don't have to. We have plenty of cases that suggest when you sell collateral out from under the secured creditor, and is there demand there? I, haven't we already severed this this link to demand? Um, we may have, but, but you know that it, perhaps it, you know if you think about the fraudulent conveyance uh, statutes, and, and in terms of the way that a uh, the remedy under those fraudulent conveyance statutes and whom they can pursue, it has a parallel line with these because it basically says that the creditor can sue the transferee and ends up with a judge, can, can go a number of different right. ways, but one of the things they can do is get the judgment against the transferee for the uh, amount of the fraudulent conveyance. So it, that's sort of inferred in some of this in a way. I, I, theoretically, I, I, as I was thinking this through, it was possible that you could have an innocent transferor but a fraudulent transferee. Had the brother mm, merely that's... wanted to get rid of these machines and had no r real intention, maybe didn't understand the value, in some sense was innocent, mm -hmm. but the sister mm -hmm. had in fact hated McClellan for a long time <laughs> and <laughs> recognized right. a potential that her mm -hmm. less thoughtful brother mm -hmm. didn't see, then we could have a situation where the initial transferee, mm -hmm. or the, the, the transferor, uh -huh. was innocent, but the under Judge Posner's reasoning, mm -hmm. the ultimate transferee was... It starts you down those tracks. It That's certainly what it does. does. Well, and Judge I, Posner suggests that this does not apply to constructively fraudulent right. transfers, That's right, but, absolutely. but there is an example where, by his right. very reasoning, it would. What really worries me about this opinion is the emphasis it puts on the debtor's intent. It mm -hmm. seems that all that's left after Judge Posner's analysis is that if the debtor has a negative intent and has carries out any act in furtherance of that which creates a debt, mm -hmm. that debt would be non-dischargeable. And that's quite a long way from what we all thought was common law fraud before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a comfortable outcome in the Cantrell case. You sort of like how it how it finishes. But if it's carried over into the credit card area. We have a, a whole new world because so much of the recent credit card case law has focused either on the nature of the representation made 
or on the nature of reliance on whatever representation was made. And it's at least arguable that both of those elements could be taken out of the equation by having the, the uh, creditor merely allege that the debtor never intended to pay and in furtherance of that intention, use the credit card. I'm well, what's troubled. wrong with that? I mean, isn't that the way the cases are supposed to come in? I mean, if, if, well, they, if, if a person it, has no intention to pay, they use the credit card, then the debt should not be dischargeable. I mean, the, case, the issues that I see is where the debtor can't pay but doesn't know they can't pay. Any reasonable person would know that they couldn't pay. But you look at that debtor's intention and if the debtor really thinks they can pay, even though any reasonable person would say that they can't pay, then the debt is discharged. Well, Tom, I think that what you, you're pointing to is one of the other things that, that concerns me in the intention. I, I agree with you completely where the intention is clear. Intention, however, is very hard to prove and is almost always proven by circumstantial evidence. And in fact, fraud is one area where we have a great history of how to prove intention through the badges of fraud. First, there were the historical badges of fraud that most of us learned at some point in our law school career, which had to do with rendering the, the uh, debtor insolvent and, and transfers to a family member and transfers for less than adequate uh, consideration. And typically, they've said that that no one of, uh, of those alone will support a finding of the intention to defraud. But if you get enough of them, a presumption is created which then has to be rebutted. So that's the way it works. In the bankruptcy context, we've ha I think we've had a sort of a growth of a, of a new group of badges of fraud, much more credit card specific, which have to do with the amount of balance, whether a, um, a notice of uh, over overuse has gone out, or whether the, the, the use of the card has been restricted in some way, and things of that nature. Whether they've been to see a lawyer. Yeah, whether they've been to see a lawyer. <laughs> and some of these badges of fraud are, are quite different from the historical badges of fraud. And I, I guess one of my concerns is that if we use the badges of fraud to come to the intention, then instead of having a debtor with a negative intention acting through the use of the credit card, we'll have a debtor who's presumed to have negatively intended something because of a certain group of circumstances being, and then uses the credit card. And that is not as comfortable to me as a finding, a direct finding of actual intent. One of the things that troubles me is that we have uh, Field v. Manns, which was a real estate deal. Yeah. And we now have this McClellan v. Cantrell case that is a fraudulent conveyance right. uh, situation perhaps making the law, making the precedent for the typical 523A2A A2, uh, case, which is a credit card case. How do you take precedents from such different factual uh, areas and move them into something that is sui generis? Well, let me expand on that point because that's what worries me too. Well, this may be, Judge Martin, as, as you alluded to um, earlier, just um, unrealistic uh, whimsy by law professors, but um, my concern is that um, by by taking away the the neat set of requirements that we thought had pertained, we've uh, we, we've allowed the creditor to stay in court on yeah. these issues. I mean, we've opened up the door to make them non-spurious claims at the outset, and when you look at um, who has the resources and and the um, oh, yeah. capacity. In, in this litigation, we, we've put debtors um, at a terrible disadvantage with this notion that any artifice, trick, or device, uh, there's such nebulous, open-ended terms uh, that um, it, uh, I just think it opens up the door to a lot more litigation. In uh, McClellan versus Cantrell, there was no citation to credit card cases, and there was no indication that the Seventh Circuit had, was thinking in that direction at all. So I don't know if, I, I, I agree with you that it's um, a problem or at least a potential problem because of the difference in bargaining power of weight in the courtroom that uh, a credit card uh, company can bring. Well, if, they can, if they can make a plausible argument and not be subject to 
uh, a 523 um, recover, or cre a recovery from creditors for, for bringing a, an unreasonable case, I, and I, Under unfortunately, D, D, yeah, 523, D, then I think they're going to feel a greater freedom to bring these. We've and already that seen that. We've already seen them using these cases as leverage to get settlements. Well, I think this Dropping the cases in the few instances in which the debtors demonstrate they're ready to try it, yeah. and the creditors pull out because they weren't able to leverage their reaffirmation or their settlement. And Judge Posner may not have seen the credit card connection. I don't want to put him on the spot, but I bet David's bank clients will. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, the, I mean, from, from a pure profit point of view, watching the, the dischargeability claims and they turn into a certain number of dollars, realizing under what set of circumstances they've historically been worth bringing, if they can move this, move this logic to that vast volume of, of credit card debt and just make a small difference, just make a small difference in how, in how they leverage it, win a few cases in that regard, then it will make kind of a macro change in that regard. So, an interesting and troubling case, and I guess we're not going to see the full implications of it for a while. Well, it may be limited to the Seventh Circuit by other decisions, but there's also a chance that this is one that could go to the Supreme Court. And, and the other, uh, tying it to the first topic, I think one of the most interesting things in, in all of this is as uh, financing patterns change, you know, with consolidation, uh, more, second mortgages or thirds or whatever they are, and with just the huge increase in credit card. Uh, lending over the last uh, 10 years or whatever, we now see the language of the bankruptcy code, you know, put against these uh, enormous billions of dollars coming in where the stakes are very high. And, uh, you know, the beauty of the code and the job of the judges is to figure out how to take that language and uh, make it work and do what's fair and comply with the statute as these lending patterns change. Well, you make a good point. In any individual case, the stakes are quite small, mm -hmm. but in the aggregate, um, for the credit industry, oh, the yeah. stakes are enormous, yes. which is why there's the willingness to litigate the uneconomical individual case for the uh, the broader precedent. Um, so maybe maybe more to come um, on this one. I certainly think so. Thank you, Judge Martin. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to uh, turn our attention now to a uh, to a couple of business law topics. Having done a couple of consumer topics. We're going to begin with an issue that um, is a contemporary issue, and it's been an issue, Judge Small, I, I guess, in the case law for some time. We, we all know that the sale of significant assets in Chapter 11 can occur in, in really one of two ways, the traditional way through a plan of reorganization, but also uh, through a Section 363 um, sale. Um, obviously, the procedures uh, the rigmarole one goes through under 363 uh, is not nearly as complex and as daunting under uh, 1129. And, and so there's an enormous temptation uh, to, to look to uh, sell substantial assets under 363. In light of that, what, what limits um, ought to be placed on uh, the sale of substantial assets outside the context of a plan. Right. Well, you're right. This issue has been around for quite a while. The two leading cases, Lionel from the Second Circuit and Branna from the Fifth, were decided in 1983. The uh, dissent in the Lionel case, Judge Winner said that uh, the language of, you, you couldn't find language that's plainer than 363B that you can sell the property. And he says that courts should not be grafting stringent conditions on those sales, whether it's in Chapter 7 or, or Chapter 11. But that's exactly what courts have done. In the Braniff line of case, line of cases that it holds that the sale can't be a substitute for the plan or it can't be an end run around the plan requirements or the protections that Chapter 11 creditors would have. The Lionel line ho holds that uh, there must be a substantial business justification for the sale. And there, there have been a lot of cases both allowing sales and uh, disapproving sales. And they list a number of factors, uh, sound business reason or an emergency, depreciating value, uh, has to be proposed in good faith, adequate, and reasonable notice, and a fair and reasonable price. Now, sometimes it's pretty hard to uh, get a handle on those standards, and it gives the court a lot of discretion, and uh, you may find a lot of diversity from court to court around the country on uh, what sales are, 
are allowed. And my own opinion is I, I, I look at really two things, and, uh, and that is, is has there been sufficient notice? And I'm not talking about uh, we're going to sell the assets for X dollars. I want to know the circumstances, the, the true circumstances of the sale, so, like you might see in a disclosure statement. And uh, also, I want to be sure that the debtor is not trying to do an end run around the protections of uh, Chapter 11. That's basically what I look for. I, my, my feeling is when a debtor files Chapter 11, they get tremendous benefits. They get the automatic stay and virtually uh, unfettered uh, control of, of the assets. On the other hand, creditors get some protections, too. They get the right to vote. They get the right to disclosure, a, a confirmation hearing, plan scrutiny, and an absolute priority rule, and, and uh, in, in our circuit, at least uh, under Bryson Properties, the, uh, the, uh, the, new, the new capital exception to the absolute priority rule. So uh, the, that's what, that's what I Judge Small, how do you identify an end run around a plan? What does that look like on the ground? Well, uh, it's, <laughs> it's one of these things you know it when you see it, I guess, but it <laughs> usually involves an insider transaction where uh, an insider is trying to sell assets to uh, a friend or uh, to themselves. And uh, we see this a lot in the, the, uh, the high-tech industries, where you see companies that have uh, spent all this money developing a product, then they go into Chapter 11 and uh, try to sell the product to, uh, basically, to themselves, the, in, the insiders. Now, that happens in Chapter 7, too, but at least you know that the Chapter 7 trustee is trying to get the best price. Mm -hmm. You don't always have that situation in Chapter 11. A, a dynamic that I've observed in a couple of cases I've had but may not be generally applicable is that the debtor comes in usually in a very down market for their particular product and maybe for their whole uh, enterprise. And at that time, they see any offer they can get for these assets to be quite good offer and often is presented early as an emergency. We got to sell now or the market's going to collapse. And, and at least in those instances where we haven't sold and, and it's dealt with uh, communications, um, one t time it was television stations, another time it was um, radio or te telephone bands, um, the market's reversed itself after the sale has been refused and strangely enough they were coming back not wanting to have sold and and coming up with competing plans to produce a whole lot more money. So I think one of the dynamics is that the debtor is often so desperate at the time they come in that uh, they're presenting things as if that's the only sale they'll ever get and the creditors will get nothing if they don't sell now. And how to deal with that emergency where you really can't predict what the market's going to do in these areas. The other language in there that I like, uh, there's, a, there's a book about these sales, uh, I think it's asset, it's sales, it's Richard Tilton's a wonderful book in this area. He uses the phrase creeping plan. <laughs> That's the phrase. And, and he uses it in a number of ways. One of the things he talks about, and if you look at Braniff, I think, is that, they, that the proposed sale motion also says how you're going to distribute the assets. It says more than the, all the money's going to come to the estate. So uh, it's interesting because some of these three, three, three issues uh, move in that direction, and that's one of the things that judges struggle with. Well, they say creeping plan, um, plan sub rosa, mm -hmm. uh, have a lot of terminology, all of which suggests that there's some improper manipulation of Section 363. But I wonder, and, and Judge Small, you're, you're the perfect one to ask, um, whether uh, or not, in point of fact, the ability to sell substantial assets in 363 in a small business case uh, is a way of uh, dealing with some of the problems that the uh, expense and uh, cumbersome procedures in uh, Chapter 11 going through the plan process makes uh, Chapter 11 uh, very unattractive for small businesses. Well, it certainly is more efficient to do it under 363B, and it's cheaper, and you can do it faster. But my experience is you probably have to be more vigilant in the small case than you do in the large case because you have no creditors committees essentially in in chapter 11 small business cases you've got a creditors committee in the large cases and also there, there's more opportunity for mischief with the insiders yep. in the small business case than there would be in the larger case and it really make, makes a point I've been trying to make for years is what we need is a separate chapter for small business cases modeled on chapter 12 
where you have a supervising trustee that looks at the sales, for instance. In Chapter 12, one of the uh, Chapter 12's enumerated duties is to appear and be heard with respect to sales of property of the estate. You don't have anything like that in Chapter, uh, sure. chapter 11. We talked about end runs. Is it potentially also an end run around 203 North LaSalle when you, when you have insiders purchasing substantial assets? Or, or would you now read, if you have insider purchasers, that you have to um, uh, I expose the company or the assets to some market test of value? Would you read? Well, certainly in the Fourth Circuit, that's one of the tests that uh, you'd have to meet. You'd have to expose it to the market under price and properties. And I would, would think that the property, if it's going to be sold under 363, would have to be exposed to the market. And it's interesting what that means. And one of the, my experiences is I think, you know, they often talk about Chapter 13 being so different among the different districts. But truthfully, th I think 363, and particularly how much you have to uh, play, d d demonstrate that the market is really seeing what the opportunity is here. The difference in what judges require around the country is quite extraordinary in terms of some districts where they have a lot of these sales. There's a, a very clear set of uh, uh, rules, and not necessarily lo uh, local rules that have been published, but if you call a local lawyer, you find that there's a very specific ways of, of doing it. In the vast majority of districts where this doesn't happen all that much, um, you find some districts where they require you to put a disclosure statement together and show what would happen if it were, if it were liquidated, much like you do in, in the disclosure statement in, or in the plan where you show the liquidation analysis. But I think, from my point of view, if you're not distributing uh, assets differently, it really comes back to how much you test the market for it. You know, have you really done what somebody would expect to uh, broadly see whether this value, and obviously if it's an insider purchasing it, it's, it's even a higher standard, it seems. Right. Well, it seems to me if, if, there's, if there, the sale is pursuant to a bidding process, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But when you're selling to insiders, you really need some independent third party to give you some... Uh, evidence that this is a good transaction, uh, maybe even appointing an examiner for that limited purpose or uh, appointing an expert witness to, uh, to tell the court that this is... And there's, like you say, there's hardly a place where it's more important to know your judge. The local legal culture can be one in which the creditors, even if they're not formed as a committee, will object to these sales for any number of reasons, and the judge will, in the absence of, of an objection, give little scrutiny. In other courts, the judges give tremendous scrutiny regardless of creditor action, and, and you just have to know what court you're in. One of the sweetest things about this to me is that if here's where 363 probably uh, is, in a sense, fairer than the plan, because in 363, the judge is going to say, what have you done to sell this business? But truthfully, if you put that plan together very quickly in a case, you put a plan together very quickly to sell with minor inside involvement, so some but not major, you know, that plan and you've got dollars coming in um, and it's in the early stages so that you've still got the benefit of the exclusive period, you're probably going to test the market a lot less than you're going to test the market, it, you're required to test the market in a 363 sale. So it really turns it upside down in some ways. It sounds to me as if you're sell if, if you are selling major assets through 363, you're really converting it to a liquidating plan because there won't be anything left to organize, reorganize. That's, exactly. That's often what it is. Right, it's convert, sometimes it converts and sometimes it's a liquidating plan. But why is it that in so many of these cases, um, Cajun Electric, uh, the Condere case that, that cited your materials, um, Judge, that um, one of the assets being sold is the company's claims against its officers and directors? <laughs> well, and, uh, the question almost answers itself. I mean, it's uh, the... <laughs> The, uh, the people that are controlling the sale maybe have ul ulterior motives. They want to uh, uh, get rid of their own personal liability, and I think you've got to be, be very careful about uh, releasing those claims. And, Go ahead. If please. you're a buyer in that situation and you're really a good faith third party buyer, you're really in a very complicated mm -hmm. position because, you know, and, and the lawyer for the debtor is in a very complicated position because now. The buyer is saying, I'd like to buy it, I'll pay, you know, two million dollars or a hundred thousand, whatever the number is, it doesn't make that much difference. And it appears that that's a good track to be on. But you have the directors or the shareholders or the, the owners of the closely held business saying, well, I'm not going to let this sale happen unless I get off the hook. So then the, the, we've seen some examples. So what debtor's counsel has to do is basically he or she has to sort of really understand the fiduciary nature 
talk to their client and say, you know, you, you are the board of directors and you could fire me, but if you do try to fire me over this, you're in trouble. We've even seen some examples in the larger cases where the threat is to replace the board with a responsible party under a section of the bankruptcy code. And it's a very interesting interplay if, you, if, you, if you're a good faith buyer in that circumstance to make sure that the, the owners may be entitled to something, but to make sure that what they're getting is, is, is not more than, is, is not being sort of drained away from the estate. Well, I guess this is um, an area as well that, that's not going to be settled anytime soon. There, there's so much strategic behavior that yeah. potentially attends these sales. There's been, I guess, some discussion, the cases in your outline, Judge, about, well, the fact we have 363M that says that even if uh, there's a decision on, on appeal contrary to the approval of the sale that you protect um, the uh, purchaser. purchaser. Some parties have found that that makes this a, a pretty attractive way to structure claim settlements. Um, do you, have, have you seen that? I, ha I have seen that, and there's a case, the uh, Prezell case uh, that's cited in the materials, where uh, the I guess there was a Chapter 7 debtor wanted to, uh, the, debtor, uh, the trustee wanted to settle a claim that the debtor had against his employer. And uh, that was settled as a sale. I mean, they, they uh, and therefore, unless it was stayed pending appeal, it, it would not be reversed on appeal. I, I had a situation like that where a Chapter 7 trustee wanted to settle the debtor's claim against the employer. and. Uh, the debtor objected, saying, no, the $40,000 that you want to pay for the claim is, is uh, too low. So I said, well, let's have an auction here, and we'll have uh, sealed bids. And the debtor came in and bid $100,000 to buy that claim. Ultimately mm -hmm. went to court, and he lost. But uh, well, Where does a debtor get $100,000 to bid for a claim? Well, that was an issue in the next bankruptcy case. <laughs> <laughs> generous exemptions these days in North <laughs> Carolina, I guess. Uh, well, an area, again, that uh, I, I guess we'll, we'll all be um, sensitive to. Um, we uh, we want to turn now um, to uh, to Dave and Lander and uh, our, our final uh, topic, um, dealing with a subject that's confounded the rest of the panel, um, but that David seems to have uh, mastered. So, uh, we all hope to learn something. And, and I'm talking about asset securitization and the reason that, that we believe this to be a timely topic, and David will be talking about it, but one of the, uh, uh, one of the goals of revised Article 9 um, is to make uh, the world uh, a safer, more comfortable place for asset securitization. Um, so if I might um, ask you to indulge us, and maybe start off by describing a basic asset securitization transaction, and then we'll try to take it from there. Sure. Thanks, Larry. Um, first of all, asset securitization is a pretty intimidating term. I mean, it just, it just, it's got a lot of syllables, a lot more syllables than we <laughs> normally use. A lot more and, so, right? and so trying to move through it seems, uh, I think it seems more difficult than it, than it really is. So let me first, uh, let me break it down and then let me compare it with traditional lending. And uh, the, one of the, I think I named my paper, what is asset securitization and why should a bankruptcy judge care? So we'll also try to, as we move through, to show why the bankruptcy judge should, should care. Okay. Traditional lending, you've got uh, a, a, an enterprise that needs some funds. So I'll call that the fund seeker. We usually call it the borrower. And then you've got somebody who wants to lend them some money, a funds provider or the lender. So in a traditional situation, uh, they're arguing over how much they're going to borrow how much they're going to lend, and what the cost of it's going to be, what the interest rate is going to be, what the fees are, or whatever. And traditionally what's happened is the uh, lender says, okay, I'll lend you $100,000, and to reduce my risks, I'm going to take a security interest or a mortgage. What assets do you have? And I want to be able to uh, get ahead, everybody, every, ahead of everyone else with regard to those assets. So I'll take a security interest or a mortgage in those assets. The borrower will continue to own the assets and use them, the equipment, accounts receivable, inventory, real estate, whatever it is. But if there's a default, the lender has some special rights. The lender has some special rights. So that's the, the, the traditional situation. Now, with asset securitization, and let's, let's build to it in a couple of steps, what the funds provider says is, let's do this a little differently, okay? Instead of 
uh, us taking a security interest. Suppose that, tell us what you have that's going to turn into cash soon. And they say, well, we have uh, accounts or chattel paper. We'll start with those. And, um, and, and then the um, funds provider says, well, why don't I buy that? Why don't I buy those assets, the chattel paper and the accounts receivable from you? And they'll sell, lift, liquidate. They'll turn into cash. And in fact, we all probably know about the industry called factoring, which has been around a long time, which is the first building block to get to asset securitization, in my view. And so we say, in a factoring situation, the factor actually bought those assets, bought the accounts receivable or bought the chattel paper, paid some money, and uh, went about its merry way. Now, securitization takes it a couple of steps further. Securitization says, well, the, the, asset pro the, the funds provider doesn't really want to own those, uh, uh, these accounts receivable or chattel paper or whatever it is, anything that's going to turn into cash. So they say, I'm going to organize a new company. I'm going to organize a new company, and the sole purpose of that company is to buy these um, cash-producing assets from you. And I'm going to organize it in a way and make it really hard for it to file bankruptcy. I'm going to have a whole lot of bells and whistles and independent directors and maybe make it a Delaware business trust or whatever it is to make it very difficult. So I'm going to organize a new company. I'm going to make it as bankruptcy remote as we can. And then how am I going to get money for that company? Well, the, the word securitization really means we're going to take this new company and we're going to sell it to financial institutions or the public. And we're going to tell them what they're going to buy is they're going to buy a company that owns these cash-producing assets because it bought them from the borrower. At the end of the transaction, what we see is that what we used to call the borrower, the funds seeker, we look at their balance sheet, they no longer have their cash-producing assets. They never long, no longer have the, 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 the accounts or chattel paper or whatever or the other kinds of things that could produce cash. They haven't instead what they've been paid. The new company uh, is owned by whoever provided the cash, and what they own is these, are these cash-producing assets, and they are in a bankruptcy remote entity. So uh, that's, that's the uh, sort of the typical, now it's, there, there are some other ways of funding. I mean, you don't have to just sell it to the public. There's some other ways of bringing the dollars in. But if you look afterwards, you see a difference in the balance sheet of the borrower um, from what you saw in a traditional asset a, a lending situation. So initially, the issue is going to be if the fund seeker, if I have my priorities right, so if the fund seeker files, has financial problems and, and files, mm -hmm. I guess the first and, and the, the principal bankruptcy issue that we faced is whether or not those assets, even if secured, mm -hmm. whether or not they're part of the estate yes. at all. Yes, and uh, let, let's look at that for a second because. Um, the asset securitization industry has grown, as, as, as you say in your, in your question, extraordinarily, and it thinks it can grow a whole lot more. There are a bunch more fund providers, or in these cases, funds facilitators, because it's not even their money, the person that's putting the uh, fund seeker together with money. Um, so, so one of the goals of this thing is to be able to say to the fund seeker, well, we can get you money at a lower cost and in greater amount if we can make sure that if you go into bankruptcy and your business fails, then what would be cash collateral in a bankruptcy you don't own and has been effectively sold, and sold is the key word here, effectively sold to this new company, which has very limited business activity. So you've got an bus operating business over here that in a sense, if you look at their balance sheet, the fuel for what would be their Chapter 11, if they went into a Chapter 11 if they needed to, and that is the cash collateral pool is extraordinarily thinner than it would be in a traditional borrowing situation. Uh, and what, what brings us all here really is uh, the revisions to Article 9. And let's talk about those for just a minute. Um, revised Article 9, which is intended to go to, into effect July 1, 2001, has now been adapted, I, adopted, I think, by 27 states. Even though it's been adopted, them it's not going to affect until July 1st, uh, 2001. That's in order to get everybody on an even starting time. And a lot of other states are, you know, considering it or, or whatever. So uh, likely, a lot of states are going to uh, uh, have it by the time it goes into effect. So the asset securitization industry and the lawyers that represent them uh, 
have been focusing on how they can make securitization, make the world safer for securitization, as you said. And so they come up with a couple of ideas. You know, they've actually gone to Congress, and there's a bill out there that basically says, um, let's have Congress say that the stuff that's been sold from the operating company to the new company ain't property of the estate. The Financial Contracting Netting Improvements Act of it, 1999. It, that might be the name of it. As you know, this, this one thing about this industry is intimidating titles. <laughs> Uh, but, and, and so, so uh, well, staying on, on this issue uh, first, there, there's two major kinds of changes that Article 9 provide, revised Article 9 provides. Staying with the issue of, quote, property of the estate. We all know, we start with the bankruptcy uh, case book, that trying to figure out the role of state law and federal law in, in what is property of the estate is one of the most interesting and also one of the most confusing areas there is. So what what, what happened some years ago, there's a case in the material called the Octagon case. It says um, Article 9, uh, well, let's go back a second. When Article 9 was adopted, Article, 9, Article 9's job is to provide certainty to secured lenders. Its job was, at that time, there were 20 different ways of, of providing security interest, conditional sale, chattel mortgage, field warehousing, account receivable financing. And, and a lot of others. And so Article 9 said, uh, we, if, let's provide to a potential lender certainty. And so if all kinds of lenders can come in and they can know that if they follow the rules, the rules for making it enforceable between the lender and the borrower, the rules for perfection so they can beat out the bankruptcy trustee and subsequent uh, lien creditors, they'll know who they beat out and they'll know their priorities if there's other secured creditors. They'll know the rules for enforcement and all of that. Well, the genius of Article 9 was bringing all of these in, and um, they, 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 they're extraordinarily successful. Now, they, as we'll see in just a minute, they left out some areas. Now, Article 9 applies, as we all think, to security interests in personal property. But coming back to what I said about factoring, the drafter said, well, we're going to bring in conditional sales. Why shouldn't we? allow the factor who's providing a, a parallel, uh, providing the dollars to feel just as comfortable as a traditional secured lender. And they scratched their head and said, how do we do that? So they said, let's make Article, let's make define Article 9 security interest such that Article 9 applies not only to traditional sales and taking a security interest, I'm mean, traditional security interest, but to certain limited sales, to sales of accounts received accounts and sales of chattel paper. And the purpose of that was to provide the same level of certainty to other kinds of secured lenders as they provided to factoring. And it, and, and it worked pretty good. Okay. Now, there were two complications, and I'll try to take them separately. First is, um, the first is that what, they, what the exception in Article 9 for covering sales is very narrow. It's accounts and chattel paper. So the asset securitization industry came along and said, you know, we want a lot of other things to be securitized between, besides just what's defined as accounts and chattel paper. So the first thing that the drafters did was they said, okay, we'll open the doors broader, more broadly. And they said, okay, now um, we'll redefine accounts so that the definition is much broader, it takes in some license revenues and, and all kinds of things that weren't in old kind of accounts. We'll even, even broaden the definition of chattel paper a bit to make an mm -hmm. electronic chattel paper. And we'll say that sales of promissory notes will also be subject uh, to, to Article 9. And then we'll carve out from the Article 9 definition of general intangibles a subcategory called payment intangibles and say that, and, and uh, these are accounts plus or maybe what we thought of as contract rights. They have a little bit like executory contracts uh, to them. And they're basically, what I'm calling was cash collateral producing stuff that they own. So almost any asset that you might securitize will now be or come to lie one covered by revised articles. Yes, None. the sale of those assets, it, 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 I mean, there's patents and trademarks and some specific kinds of intellectual property they chose to leave out. But um, they brought these in. And, and the reason that they, the asset securitization people needed that so much or sought for it is they said, hey, you gave secu regular secured lenders certainty. You gave uh, factors certainty, but you didn't give us certainty. And it's interesting because the state law that says, if I buy the, uh, these, these various kinds of assets, how do I know I'm protected from the 
later lien creditor of the seller or a subsequent buyer, all the same people that Article 9 provides. So the answer prior to the revision, and this had a limiting effect on securitization, was the law is uncertain because the sale of those items was not, A, it was uncertain, and B, it was non-uniform. It was very confusing. So it would be non-uniform, right. non-code sure. law right. that would govern. Is that so, where Arctic and Gas came in? Because it looked at the link between the seller of those uh, asset-producing uh, intangibles or whatever, mm -hmm. and whether you could isolate the, that, that entity's bankruptcy? Sure, in, in, in the following way. Um, this is all about, remember, the provision of funds for a fund seeker and the cost, okay? So what one change the asset securitization people wanted was greater certainty and uniformity, and they said they could lower the price. So, and, and revised Article 9 basically gives them. The second issue, the Octagon case, is, even, is really much more interesting. It goes back to Larry's original point of property. Is, it property. is the stuff that was sold property of the estate or not? And Article 9, both old and new, mostly covers security interests, and really defines its coverage of sale in the definition of security interest. So what Octagon and some other cases said, well, wait a minute, if the seller sold all of this cash collateral producing stuff to this new entity, um, but the protection that's offered against the bankruptcy trustee and others is offered in the context of protection that's offered to a secured creditor. And the sale, the, the protection is, the protection that's offered to a secured creditor, is it really a sale? And Octagon said no. They said it, it didn't take the cash collateral producing assets, even though they called it a sale, and move them to the bankruptcy remote entity. And in fact, it, they're still there. So this was a, the second prong of the enormous challenge for the revi revisionists. And what they've tried to do here is, is, is quite fascinating and very, very complicated. And there's a big dispute. There's two articles that came out recently. Ray Warner has one in the American Bankruptcy Institute Journal, and a guy named Paul Shupak has one in the American Bankruptcy Law Journal. And here's the fix they gave. They gave a fix of two kinds. In the statute, they basically said, the drafters in revised Article 9, that if you sold this stuff, you don't have any more rights in it. And they put a comment in another section that said, we really want to overrule Octagon, and we don't think it makes any sense. And even though this sale is called a security interest, it's really a sale, sale. for Don't fool with it. Okay? So Ray Warner's piece says they fixed it. Mm -hmm. Paul Shupak, who was uh, one of the key drafters of these provisions, he says just the opposite. He says that by, because they weren't able to totally separate sales and security interests in Article 9, and they're calling a sale a security interest, that the first set of cases will all be on whether it's part of the property of the estate. And I, and I called Paul in, in preparation for this, because, and he thinks that, uh, although he might agree with the, 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 their understanding, that they just couldn't fix that problem in Article 9 the way they wanted. He thinks that when you ask most judges to look at this situation, or when you ask a lot of judges to look at it, they're going to say, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that you want me to find that this sale was so complete that it is nothing left in the seller, even though the law that covers the whole thing and that provides protection for the buyer is Article 9 of the UCC that covers security interests? How can that be? So there's still a fact question, yeah. potentially, did the debtor retain any interest, any of the bundle of sticks mm -hmm. that comprise that asset. Mm -hmm. and, and Octagon that, is not dead. Well, and there's so much control left in the debtor with regard to these assets. I mean, he, they're generating the accounts, mm -hmm. they're, they're working, I mean, this is the, the cash end of the business, mm -hmm. and what the business does is going to have such an influence. It's really hard to separate that to say that the debtor has no, no longer any interest in that part of its business. And these transactions are structured with that in mind, so as technically as much as possible, we, we, we talk about whether it's recourse or not recourse. Yeah. We talk about who's going to be the collection arm for these things. Right. We talk about all those pieces. So they're structured in a way to try to make them as clean as possible. But as a practical matter, um, it, 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 it leaves a residue of facts that, that may 
not provide the certainty, because this is all about certainty. So mm -hmm. we, we have now all these cases where you try to determine whether something's a true lease or a right. security <laughs> issue. <laughs> so we're going to have the same thing with all these different factors. And, and the stakes are got a lot a of zeros sale? against them. That's a very good analogy that I hadn't thought about, but it, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, we could really, we could see that. But isn't the securitization industry still better off because at least now the quote-unquote sale of financial assets other than accounts and shares, even if it's still a security, it's still under Article 9, which means the rules on perfection and, and priority are still quite clear. And while they would rather be a buyer and completely remote from the bankruptcy proceeding, still better to know to be a fully perfected, protected secured creditor in the bankruptcy than be subject to the vagaries of non-uniform state law. So there's still an advance in the uh, revised Article 9 from the perspective of the securitization industry. Absolutely, and it helped demonstrate the two different kinds of changes that revised Article 9 makes. One is it does provide great, we look at Article 9, we look at, we, we, it provides much greater certainty in all the issues that you talk about. The, the real question is since bankruptcy allows use of cash collateral, um, use of cash collateral against the will of the secured creditor if adequate protection is provided, and it allows cram down under 1129B uh, so that they can change the bargain. If you, you need to separate out these thing, two things. The one thing that is clearly, it, it, they've clearly done successfully, is to say that the normal Article 9 protection, absent bankruptcy, is an extraordinary improvement mm -hmm. for assets that weren't covered prior to Article 9. And it may turn out that the changes uh, overruling uh, Octagon end up getting there too. It's just that that's an additional improvement that they seek that we'll just have to wait and see what happens on. David, are we going to know whether this works when the uh, securitization or the, the entity, the fund provider that's participating in securitization declines to participate in the carve out for the professionals in the Chapter 11? <laughs> well, you know, that's a, a great question because one question will be we might know that it works because these companies are not filing Chapter 11 because they mm -hmm. feel that the fuel, the cash collateral producing assets are so thin and the chances of those initial fights will destroy the opportunity, but that there will be some cases in which they will file and the battle will be fought that way or substantive consolidation or fraudulent conveyance, the other issues that are out there. Now, in the revision process, I understand the banks had some concern about this vast expansion in coverage because almost by definition, it picks up transactions that are not really security interests and not really asset securitizations, things like loan participations. And ultimately, there was some compromise or adjustment made in, in revised Article 9 to to appease the lending community that they would not have to go through um, the expense and dislocation of filing financing statements and the like for, for true loan participation transactions. How, how, did, how did that get resolved? Now, that was an interesting compromise. Once again, we have to put financial institutions into several categories because it pitted the asset securitization industry against traditional lenders who say, if I lend $2 million and I'm a small bank, maybe I want to sell some of that off to smaller banks. And, or alternatively, it's a really big loan, and they participate the loan out, and they didn't want to have to file, and they thought they were uh, covered by what we call a payment, intang a payment intangible. So the compromise was this. Um, with perfection for payment intangibles, perfection for payment intangibles is automatic under revised Article 9. That means that in these, in these loan participation issues, they're automatically perfected, so they don't have to, they don't have to file and have to do anything else. Now, it does create an additional challenge, though, because since there isn't two right. challenges, there isn't a public record. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if somebody comes to a, a, a financial institution, I'd like to sell you my, uh, my, payment in, my payment intangibles, somebody has to say, well, I am taking a different kind of risk altogether that they already sold them to somebody else. Right. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, then, and then the other issue is, I think, true purchasers of payment intangibles, thinks, people think, will file because they want to make sure that if that it's recharacterized in some way that they that it's not a really a sale but is a, a, a non-sale security interest that they're still perfected. Is there provision for protective filing as there is in the current law for leases and consignments? 
Uh, there's not a specific piece, but I think the notion is that that will likely be done. Well, nothing could stop you from doing it, but again, right. the SPV or the investors can't ever be sure, because there's no requirement of filing, that the assets they're purchasing right. were not previously encumbered or right. even sold, I guess. Right, and just to clarify, make sure I'm, I'm clear on this, the, the uh, uh, sales of, of accounts receivable and certain other kinds of property do still require filing. Mm -hmm. Just payment intangibles? Uh, just payment, payment intangibles and I promissory notes are mm -hmm. automatically perfected. I, I, I may have missed one other category, but I think those are the ones. All right, let me ask you one question. Um, Maybe, maybe an unfair question. Assume revised Article 9 is, is successful and, and it's, um, it's truly a sale and the assets are subject to and, and you have this bankruptcy remote entity and the originator, the, the fund seeker as you termed it, files bankruptcy and Judge Martin looks at the situation and says I'm going to substantively consolidate the SPV and the, um, and the original uh, or, or the debtor. Is that a risk? Well, it's a risk. Once again, it's a risk um, that's the picture. That's the picture that the the transaction is trying to avoid. So typically, in these circumstances, and we see them more in um, opinions of counsel really than anything else. What what you try to do in those situations? What they try to do is identify all the factors in substantive consolidation, and then as hard as possible, uh, as much as possible, given the practicality of the business situation. Put the, put the transaction together in a way that reduce, that, that basically uh, uh, takes all those prongs and says they're just not there. Uh, but that is that is definitely an ult, a, a significant worry. I'm sure that's a letter that the price of which will go up as soon as there's one adverse opinion. <laughs> yes. well, 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 lest you think we're, we're seeing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, in point of fact, this is reputedly the most uh, rapidly growing segment of U.S. credit markets, so we think you're going to see lots more of these transactions for, for better or worse, and, and we hope this helps some. Um, for balance, um, David mentioned two articles on, on the topic which are, which are very good, Ray Warner, right. Paul Schupack. The, the other view, there's a law review article that uh, David Carlson has done called The Rotten Foundations <laughs> of Securitization, I think of the William and Mary Law Review. So that's, that's another view that um, you can take a look at. Um, David, thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. Um, that is our program for today. Um, I, again, very much want to thank all our panelists uh, for coming in to help us uh, today to understand these important issues. We hope you enjoyed the program and found it both useful and interesting. And we urge you to please fill out the one-page evaluations that are included in the written materials available on our website, particularly if you have something positive to say. It's the only way for us to know if you find these programs useful and how we can improve them for you. For the Federal Judicial Television Network, I'm Larry Poneroff. Thanks for watching. <laughs>